John chapter 1. Okay, in John chapter 1, we're going to begin with verse 24 and read all the way to verse 37. All right, so I'll read that for you guys. Okay, and they which were sent were of the Pharisees. And they asked him, and said unto him, Why baptizest thou, if thou be not that Christ, neither Elias, neither that prophet? John answered them, saying, I baptize with water, but there standeth one among you, whom ye know not. He it is, who coming after me is preferred before me, whose shoe latchet I am not worthy to unloose. These things were done in Bethabara, beyond Jordan, where John was baptizing. The next day, John seeth Jesus coming unto him, and saith, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me cometh the man which is preferred before me, for he was before me, and I knew him not, but that he should be made manifest to Israel. Therefore am I come baptizing with water. And John bare record, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode upon him. And I knew him not, but, that, but he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, Upon whom thou see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same is he which baptizeth with the Holy Ghost. And I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. Again, the next day, after John stood and two of his disciples, and looking upon Jesus as he walked, he saith, Behold, the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the privilege that it is to know you and to serve you. And I pray uh, for the time now that we're going to look into your word, that you'll, uh, you'll make uh, your abode with us tonight, Lord, that you'll show us uh, much about your son, Jesus Christ. And I pray that he will be exalted uh, and glorified to us, and that we will glorify him with our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so uh, I'm going to talk to you tonight about an interesting subject. But before that, um, I wanted to tell you guys, I, I really like history. And I don't know if there's anybody who else, who, other who likes history. I won't make you raise your hands and embarrass yourselves if you don't want to. But uh, I, uh, I actually tried to study, to go, I tried to do, go to school, go back to school and get a master's degree to become a history teacher. And uh, God changed those plans. But, uh, but that's how I got started in that. And I read over 50 books about U.S. history within two to two and a half years. Um, loved it. It was great. But um, when we look at history and we see the great men of history, um, we often see many men that impress us. And um, in U.S. history, we have folks like George Washington, one of my favorites. There's uh, Abraham Lincoln, uh, John Pershing. Anybody know that name? All right. And Dwight Eisenhower uh, is another favorite of mine. Um, in sports, you'd have Babe Ruth or Mickey, Mickey Mantle or H Hank Aaron, William Mays. World history, maybe Alexander the Great or Caesar Augustus. But when you, we look at each one of these men in detail, they're almost great. 
And when we look closely, we become disappointed in some area of their life. And that's history for you. The search for the perfect man. We never really find him, do we? What about us as Christians? What is, uh, what is the Christian life really all about? And what's the difference between you and a non-Christian? The difference should be the Lord Jesus Christ, the central figure of all of history. So, um, let's take a look at another scripture. Go uh, to your right and go to Colossians chapter 3, please. Colossians chapter 3. And we'll look at verse 4. Okay, and verse 4 says, When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Okay, but football is my life. It shouldn't be according to the Bible, right? Jesus is to be our life. This verse tells us that. He is our whole life. All that our life is to be, is a testimony to him, is to be a witness for him, um, especially those of us that are saved. Uh, those that aren't saved also should be uh, living for him, but they're not. But we, especially as Christians, ought to be living for him, and that should be our life. Okay, it's, uh, I'll, I'll read it again. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. That should be our hope. That should be our focus. Most of all, the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus is all the world to me, my life, my joy, my all. We sing that often. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left the crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. So as Colossians, as Colossians 3, 4 said, uh, Jesus Christ is our very life. And what, ha what he has done has made the difference and made an eternal difference for us. But Christian, have you and I f lost sight of that? Often we get real busy, even at church, we get busy with a lot of activities, um, and, then, uh, and then Jesus Christ is knocking outside. He's outside. If you've read, um, if you've read uh, chapter 3, it is, I think it is Revelation, where the, he's writing to the Laodicean church, he's knocking. He's actually knocking on the church, because he's outside the church. He's supposed to be what we're doing. The whole thing should be about him, but he's outside of that church, and many, many other churches, I think. So... Let's go back to chapter 1 of John, please, and renew, renew our focus here before we get going. Okay, John chapter 1, and let's go to verse 29. Okay, the next day, John seeth Jesus coming unto him, and saith, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Verse 35. Again, the next day, after John stood, and two of his disciples... And looking upon Jesus as he walked, he saith, Behold, the Lamb of God. And the two disciples that heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. So when, when, uh, when someone preaches the word of God, and uh, we start to see more about Jesus Christ, hopefully we'll be just like these two that follow right after him. All right, so the first, uh, just a few basic thoughts I want to share with you guys tonight. The first one is the need for the Lamb. Okay, so go with me to Matthew chapter 9, please. To the left a little bit. Matthew chapter 9. Okay, Matthew chapter 9 and verse 35 to the end of the chapter. So here we see the need for the lamb. We see our condition. Okay, verse 35 in Matthew chapter 9 says, And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them, because they fainted and were scattered abroad, as sheep having no shepherd. Then saith he unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. So this is our condition. We can see that these people that were following Jesus for a certain amount of time, they wanted to get around him. This is probably the, the, the most uh, exciting thing that's ever happened in their life, hopefully for us as well, when Jesus comes around. He, he comes, they, he's teaching them, he's healing them, doing all these things, because those are the things that uh, they needed. Okay, our condition is clearly shown here in this picture as well. Man is lost. Okay, first of all, man is lost. He has no idea what he's doing or what he should do. We have many things we want to do, uh, but it is no indicator of true purpose. 
Okay, man, uh, many people um, uh, have a lot of plans, but, uh, but we really don't know where it's going to go. Okay, if you've ever worked a job, you start off working that job, and you're like, 20 years later, what are we going to be doing? I don't even know. So man is confused also, lost, and he's confused. So though a man or woman have plans and desires, the question still remains, what is it for? Okay, um, those of us who work in the automotive industry, that's what I do, um, ultimately all we're going to help people do is move a little bit. That's about it. Okay, I haven't, um, haven't had that discussion so much with my coworkers, but really that's all. Uh, I mean, they may use the vehicle for something, but all they're doing is moving people. Um, seems like we should, our life should be for more than that. Okay, so man is lost, man is confused, man is afflicted. Let me see verse 35 again, right there in Matthew 9. Jesus, and Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, and preaching uh, the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. Man is afflicted, okay? That's not really changed either. He has, uh, man has every sickness and disease, and we keep coming up with new ones. We need to be healed and not just treated. That's, that's our, that's our true, true state. Um, also in 30, verse 35, he says this, And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues. Man needs guidance. Man needs to be taught from God. You and I need to be taught by God. Um, we can go to the university and see. Now, I did not have the blessing and privilege of going to a Christian university. Um, I grew up unsaved until I was about 22 years old. Then uh, I was in the middle of a, going to a state school, and I was not saved. Um, then after I got saved, I graduated, went and did some things, worked and did some things for the Lord. Then I came back to school Went straight to state school because I just, it's my default thinking. And I knew that before, when I was there, it was pretty crazy. I come back and it, it was worse. So um, if you're in a Bible college, you know, or if you're heading that way, uh, boy, you should be thankful. It's a wonderful thing. But, um, but you can go to the universities and see how confused they are. And it's, and it's worse than ever before. So that's man's state. We're, that's the situation that man is in. Uh, he's lost. He's confused. He's afflicted, and he needs guidance. He needs a lot of help from the Lord. All right, so go with me uh, also now to Isaiah chapter 53. So we're seeing our need for the Lamb of God here. Chapter 53. Chapter 53, and we're going to start with verse 4 and read down to verse 7. Okay, verse 4 says, surely he, hath known, or surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was laid upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed. He was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. He, he is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shears is dumb. So he opened not his mouth. Here comes the lamb to die for us, for the condition that we are in. Lost, confused, afflicted. No, no purpose, no, no guidance. We're going our own way. And uh, we see the, the faithfulness of God's, or we see the faithfulness of all people here in verse 6. All we like sheep have gone astray. How many of us have ever followed God right out of the womb? Hasn't happened. So we need God to guide us. We're going astray. We're turning after our own way. No, no one's standing for God. And we're all running after sin. That's the condition. That's why we need a lamb. However, the rest of this passage shows how much he loves us. So let's read that again. Let's start at verse 5. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. Uh, this is all about the Lord Jesus Christ, and if you've read through, especially the Gospel of Matthew points directly to here, um, shows you that connection for the Jewish mind uh, to read right here and see it. And uh, 
This is, I think, probably the best place we need to start with a Jew. If we ever have a Jewish friend, we, I, have, I work with one. He's teaching me Russian. It's wonderful. But um, I'm praying for him, and I'm, I'm trying to think. Um, he sees me read the Bible a lot at lunch. And uh, I don't, he told me he doesn't really know the scripture. But, um, and I said, wow, this is amazing to me. Um, but I think it's a testimony, and I think it'll touch his heart someday if we get the t- chance to talk about this, that I've spent time trying to learn his scripture. And uh, I, will, I, I do plan to thank him for, being, for, for the fact that we get the scriptures through the Jews. But I told him, too, I said, I know that you probably have had some history. He's an immigrant from Ukraine, um, been here about 20-some years. They have some history I know that they've been through with um, anti-Semitism in Europe. And I told him, I said, there's things about Europe and about America that the culture is Christian overall, but it's not really. The heart is not Christian. But I told him, I said, real Christians love Jews. And I don't know if you've experienced that, but that's really the truth of it. So I hope he knows that. I think we, you know, we've talked. We've spent a lot of time. I've shown him you know, that I care for him. I'm going to keep praying for him. His name's Isaac. So I'm going to keep praying for him. And hopefully I can show him something out of this verse someday. All right, so... Um, his actions for us. So we see what Jesus has done for us. He's gone to the cross on our behalf here in this, in this passage. He's done it all for you and me. Okay, let's tell him how much that means to us. I think we should uh, not forget how much we needed the Lamb of God to take away our sin. And if you're still in sin, come to Jesus because he will forgive you and he'll give you everlasting life. And that's the need that you have for the Lamb. So you can come to him today. And if you're a Christian, we can come to him to renew that love that we have for him all right so that's the first thought is the need for the lamb second thought is to be the greatness of the lamb that i want to share with you um he was perfect and glorious his life was wonderful the people said of jesus in john chapter 7 not, uh, never man spake like this man in john seven forty six. one such instance so this is found in luke chapter 20 let's go there please luke chapter 20 I love reading through the Gospels. It's, it's, a, it's, a, really, it's a really enjoyable uh, thing to do. Um, all of the Bible is the Word of God, but I, I, can't help get, I, can't, I can't really get over reading the life, the life of Jesus. When I first started teaching the teenager Sunday school class, we took a series and went through all of Jesus' life. started at Genesis chapter 1. We talked all about uh, who he is. Uh, we looked at prophecies uh, before he would come. Then we looked at, um, we also looked at, um, what was it? We looked at kind of appearances of Jesus in the Old Testament. Then we went through a few, few more prophecies. Went, then we focused kind of mainly on Luke, but we hopped around a little bit because we find a lot of things happening in Luke that aren't in the other Gospels as well. But it was a good time. I hope they enjoyed it, but I really did. Um, I'm, I'm, that might be the case every Sunday when I come out of Sunday school. I said, Man, that was great. I, was like, I don't know if they thought that, but I enjoyed it. <laughs> it happens a lot. But. Okay, so uh, Luke chapter 20, and let's read verse 22 through 26. 22 through 26. Now we have a lot of folks coming at Jesus, asking him all kinds of things and giving him a lot of trouble trying to catch him. So here's, what, here's one instance of how he handles it. Is it lawful for us to give tribute unto Caesar or not? Or no? Verse 23. But he perceived their craftiness and said unto them, Why tempt ye me? Show me a penny. Whose image and superscription hath it? They answered and said, Caesar's. And he said unto them, Render therefore unto Caesar the things which be Caesar's. And unto God the things which be God's. And they could not take hold of his words before the people. And they marveled at his answer and held their peace. Amen. That's wonderful. I love reading and seeing things like that. The way he would handle people. I'm starting to learn that, actually. When I, when I get around people, I get around my coworkers, and people want to make fun of you know, Christians, or they want to ask questions just to poke. And uh, I, had, I had this happen recently. I wasn't in the conversation. I was actually reading my Bible at my desk during lunch. But I had another coworker in the back in the, in the lab at, at our office asking some of the other engineers, you know, um, I think it's really funny when Jesus comes to the fig tree and, ca- and uh, it's not the time of the figs. So he curses the tree. And he's, the guy laughs and says, well, it's not the time of the figs anyway. And I'm thinking to myself at my desk, that whole thing was an illustration that God is expecting to see fruit out of people's lives. And he had no idea. I mean, he was... I think he kind of grew up learning a little bit of this, but he's kind of, he's totally walked a different way. And uh, just, I just sat, sat there and thought to myself, wow. But when I, when I read Jesus and, and how he handles people, he doesn't just, he's not just asked this question, yes, I'll answer that question. He kind of takes over the conversation. And, uh, you know, only I think can we do that through the Spirit of God. 
But, uh, but that's one thing I'm asking the Lord to help me with, to be able to do that. When somebody asks me some question, I just say, well, maybe I'll answer that. But, but also, by the way, you know, and introduce them to the Lord because they, man, people just, uh, there are people that around us all the time that don't have any idea what's in this book. We, I, th- I think we're forgetting uh, that we have such a Christian heritage in America, but I don't, I don't think we have it really anymore. It's, or at least we don't, we don't, we don't, we see a lot of folks growing up without it now. A lot of people have no idea that the Bible says, and what Jesus says, love your enemies, they don't even know that's in there. So you know, we've got a lot of preaching to do, so we should get, get prepared for it. So the whole plan in this case was uh, for these men to catch Jesus in his words, but they couldn't. Okay, he was perfect in action and in word. Challenge after challenge, there's several more that you find in this chapter and in other chapters and in other, the other Gospels where they, they, come, they come at him and ask him these things trying to tie him up in a conversation. But, uh, but Jesus was smarter than the average politician. Okay, so, um, but let's go down now to chapter thir- or, uh, verse 39 in the same chapter. Verse 39 in Luke 20 says, let's read it down to verse 44. Then certain of the scribes answering said, Master, thou hast well said. And after that, they durst not ask him any question at all. And he said unto them, How say they that Christ is David's son? And David himself, David himself saith in the book of Psalms, the, the Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand, till I make thine enemies thy footstool. David therefore calleth him Lord. How then is he his son? No answer. They have no answer for him. I think they had no idea that he was trying to explain to them that he, the Messiah is not just a man. He's going to be God. They, they just couldn't understand any of it. Actually, because probably their hearts were hard. You see, oh, the whole part before this, they're trying to trap him. They're not trying to hear what must I do to be saved. That's, that's the heart behind that. So when he challenged the religi- religious rulers, they could, imp- they could answer him nothing. And uh, again, in verse uh, 40, it says, And after that, they durst not ask him any question at all. So that's another instance where I think we see the greatness of the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ. It's wonderful. But uh, so he, he is the, uh, he's the object of all of our worship. And let's go now uh, to uh, Philippians, please, chapter 2. This is probably a familiar passage to you guys, but it's wonderful. Um, I just think it's great to read these passages and see him lifted up the way he should be. Um, chapter 2, and we'll read verse 5 through 11. So chapter 2 in Philippians, verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God hath also, hi- also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven and things in the earth and things under the earth, that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Okay, so Jesus is the the greatest name that's ever been anywhere at any time. There's none quite like him. He's glorious in what he has done for us. And God hath given him a name which is above every name, which we saw here in verse 11. And uh, verse 10 says that at uh, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow um, of things in heaven and things in the earth and things under the earth. And uh, in verse, verse 11, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Uh, everyone will worship the Son of God and that day is coming. Um, all of your co-workers, all of your family members, all politicians, and that good news? All college professors, okay? All construction workers and all professional athletes and all translators, <laughs> everyone in this room uh, will, will bow the knee to Jesus Christ someday. Um, hopefully those of us in the room here will bow the, knee to him, uh, bow the knee to him today and every day. Okay, that's the way our life should be as Christians. All right, and if that's not true for you, it can be. Okay, so think about that today. And uh, let's look at another scripture here now in uh, Hebrews chapter 2. It's a little bit more to your right. Hebrews chapter 2, okay, 
Okay, Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 8 and 9, we'll read two verses here. Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. But, we, but now we see not yet all things put under him. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. Okay, I hope you're not confused. Um, oh, sorry. So we don't, we don't yet see this situation quite right now, though it is true. Okay, we don't see it right now, but everything and everyone will be subject to him and soon. Okay, verse 9 reminds us also that our eyes, our eyes are to be fixed on Jesus Christ, who has died for us and for every man. And I hope you're not confused about the greatness of the Lamb of God. Maybe you've got your eyes on something else tonight. Maybe you've got your eyes on LeBron James. Maybe you've got your eyes on Apple. Don't know what they're going to come up with next, right? Maybe you've got your eyes on, I don't know, hopefully not politics. It's, it's pretty easy to just take your eyes off of that because it's pretty bad. But, um, but we need to retrain our eyes on Jesus Christ himself. I think we want to serve God. You see, I get into this a lot. I want to serve God. That's what I focus my life on all the time. I'm always thinking I want to serve the Lord. Okay, but who is he? You're spending time, let's spend time reading, learning about who he is spend time in prayer talking to him. Okay, so only Jesus can feed the 5,000 without calling in catering. Okay, only Jesus can raise the dead. Only Jesus can heal the blind, cleanse the leper, and only Jesus can save the lost. The Lamb of God is great and mighty to save, and we need to recognize and believe that, that the greatness of the Lamb of God, uh, what level really he, he is at. He's wonderful, and we need to, we need to remember that. So the, the, thir the first point there then, so um, the need for the lamb, then the greatness of the lamb. Now the third thing I want to discuss with you is, is newness of life. Now this is the result of what he's done in our lives. So let's go to Romans chapter 6, please. One of these waters for me back here. All right. Oh, there's another one under here. Okay, Romans 6 and verse 3 and 4. <coughs> know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into, Je into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Verse 4, <coughs> therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so also we should walk in newness of life. I think there's two meanings to that. Newness of life, we have a new quality of life as Christians. And he's changed... Uh, the, the dirty life and the dirty heart that we used to have. He's given us um, a, a brand new life, a, a new life, a new heart. We're born again, and our life will have a different quality to it. But at the same time, I think he's looking for us to walk in newness of purpose and, and, a, and a cleaner life, not the life we used to live in. So we're dead. We are dead. Okay. Christians are dead. We are baptized into his death, we see here in verse 3. Baptized in the likeness of Jesus' death, we often say, raised in the likeness of his resurrection. All right, that's the truth of our life, and I hope, I hope you know what that's like. If, you're, if you haven't experienced that, I hope, I hope you do. I'll pray that you do. But if you have experienced that, I think we need to remember. We need to kind of review that. He's been very good to us. And it's a whole new life, all new goals and all new plans for our life. Everything's new. Everything's pure. It'll be pure if we do things his way. The resurrection has given us a new life. And there should now be a change in us. Okay, so new life in Christ has brought about great and miraculous results in the lives of those who have repented and put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Think of John Newton. Okay, if you've ever read the history of either America or many of the European countries that they had, uh, they had a lot of slavery going on, this man was a slave trader from, from Britain. He, uh, he, he, just, he just did it. This was, just, this was business to him. He would just trade human beings. No problem to him. He didn't bother him at all until he got saved. And then he realized what a wretch, he tells us, he is and was. And then he taught us about the amazing grace in Jesus Christ. That's, uh, so John Newton's the one that wrote that song, of course. Think of Saul of Tarsus. Hated Christians. How do you hate Christians and then become a Christian? Okay, I think maybe probably we hopefully don't have too much idea about hating anybody, but... There are probably some people that you just don't like or just have a hard time um, being around too often or too long. And then you think about how you could become one of them. I don't think you're usually thinking about that, at least in your flesh. I wasn't. I never do. 
But uh, another, so another thing, Saul of Tarsus, so he was, he was after Christians, trying to basically trying to kill them, trying to put them all in prison. Then he becomes a Christian. Only God, only the Lamb of God could do that to him. Think of Jack Jarvis. Some of you guys know, most of you guys know Jack Jarvis. He used to be a Jehovah's Witness. And now he's a Christian. He, he goes to our church a lot, of, a lot of the time. And he's a missionary for Jesus Christ, the, the true Jesus Christ. Okay, great. Look up here. Okay, you ever seen a bar musician before? So what they, this is what they used to look like. But I, I do, because he saved me, I don't go to those places anymore. I don't play music for that purpose anymore. Um, I often thought when I, before I came to this church, I, I had played, um, I had been in, in the choir at another church, and uh, I had, um, was asked, why don't I join choir? And I thought to myself, but aren't I disqualified? You know, I used to play for the devil. I used to play his music, okay? And, um, and I thought and prayed about it for a while, and I, and I got up there, and I started to sing in the choir, and I, and I do that here, here as well. And I thought, man, this is the highest music. Why was I playing with that garbage? You know, he's, he's, he's so, it's so good to follow him. It's, it's pure, it's holy, when, it, when, it's, when it's the desire given from him. Okay, it's wonderful to do that. All right, so um, he's renewed our affections. Um, so no more we are, are we amused, or should we at least be amused by the base things of this world. Okay, no more do we love darkness rather than light. Okay, that used to be true. That's, that's in John chapter 3. The men loved darkness rather than light. That's why they didn't even go to Jesus. When, they came, when Jesus came, uh, they just kind of wa wanted to run away from him because he was, he was light, and in him is no darkness at all. No more do we bite and devour others, but we pray for our enemies and seek to bless those that curse us. And that should be the new life that we have, the, the newness of life. All right, let's go uh, to another scripture here. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Since we're on the subject of newness of life, there's great things in this passage I want to share with you guys. So, 2 Corinthians 5, and we'll look at verse 14 through 17. For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. And that he died for all, that they which live should... Uh, should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Wherefore, henceforth we know no man after the flesh. Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. In verse 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. All things are become new. And um, especially I want, to, I want to dwell on verse 15. I think this is great. I, I often pass over verse 15 because I see verse 17. But verse 15 is wonderful to me, I think. And that he that died for all. So this is, uh, this is Jesus Christ dying for our sins. And to continue the verse, that they which li live should not henceforth live unto themselves. There should be a difference in your life. You shouldn't be speaking the way you used to speak. You shouldn't be reading what you used to read. You shouldn't be going to the places you used to go to. Um, and it's funny we have to emphasize this. I mean, we in our church, I think, understand this, but a lot of, a lot of churches don't get this. A lot of people, a lot of preachers don't preach that anymore. And uh, we, have, we have people who claim to be Christians, and probably are, but they're, they're really giving a confusing message. So we need, to, we need to live a different life, and people need to see the difference in our life. That's how, uh, you know, um, that's how they can tell whether, whether uh, something's happened in our life or not. Okay, and they which live, it says in verse 15... Okay, they which live should not live unto, should not henceforth live unto themselves. They which live is us. That's the born again Christian. Henceforth, interesting word. So from now on, or from this point forward, and I don't think the Bible means uh, from from today on, from uh, November first on. I think what the Bible is trying to say is from the day you were saved on, there should be some difference. There should be um, a clear, a little bit more of a clear testimony than than the day before that day. For Jesus Christ. So your life is no longer just for you. Uh, it is to bring honor and glory uh, to Jesus Christ. Well, how? How do we do that? Okay, so through our actions is one, one thing, through our speech. Okay, so um, also uh, your treatment of others. The way you speak to other people can really, uh, really be um, something that, that takes people by surprise. And then your love for other Christians. Okay, you should, uh, you should really love to be with God's people. Um, really funny when we go door knocking on Sunday and Saturdays and we, we go soul winning. We meet people that, uh, 
I mean, they give you a testimony, the whole thing. It's like, okay, so where do you go to church? Oh, well, I don't go to church right now. So you're looking. I love saying that. I love saying, you're looking for a church. Well, I don't know right now. I can worship God right here on my stoop. <laughs> but do you? I bet you don't. Okay, so that's, that's the thing. If you don't want to get around God's people, I don't know what. There's something wrong there. Okay, maybe you got burned somewhere, but that's not a valid reason to say, I don't want to get around Christians anymore. If you're still a Christian... You should want to be around Christians. I, I don't understand that. So um, I know things happen to people, and people have, have experiences. But, um, but how many of you, I mean, have, have had experiences, but you're still here living for God? I mean, you can raise your hands if you want, but I'm sure it would be the whole room. Okay, so um, unto him, unto him it says here, we, uh, we should live. We should not live unto ourselves, but unto him. We should be more conscious of the way we are perceived as Christians. Okay, we should be more conscious of how we're perceived and how he's perceived in our lives. Okay, ra- rather than if you'll make the big sale. Okay, rather than whether you'll get the big promotion. Okay, rather than if they will like me or not. And also, rather than um, if, it will make you fr- if it will make your friends laugh. That's, that's, I think that's something we really need to be careful about. For me personally, humor, I have to be very careful with. Um, I've, I've, I've hurt people with humor before. I noticed some people can get up and sing and stuff, and some people can't. Some people can, do, can make jokes and stuff. I can't do that. I've, I've hurt too many people with my humor, and uh, so the Lord's, Lord's helped me to realize that, and so I'm trying not to do that anymore. I'm trying not to make jokes. I'll let other people make jokes. Some people, I know that's not necessarily one of the gifts of the Spirit, but I know some people are better at that than, than others. All right, but um, so we need to be more conscious of the way in which we're perceived as Christians, okay? Are you making choices that reflect well upon Jesus? Are, or are you insisting, he's okay with me doing this? He's okay with me wearing this? He's okay with me watching this? So actually, if we are unsure of whether God is approving of something we're doing or if something we're, we're, some choices we're making, first thing we should just do is stop. We should just stop, and then we should pray, read the Bible, and get godly counsel, rather than just wonder and ask him if he approves while we do it. Okay, that's, that's really easy to do. It's really easy to slip into things like that. But we need to be looking to him all the time for guidance. Okay, we need to always ask him, does this please us? Does this please you? Um, sometimes when we get going around, get going in the Christian life, it's been years and years, we stop asking that question sometimes. We need to be asking the Lord, does this please you? Okay, so we need to read, pray, and get godly counsel before we make decisions that we're not sure about. All right, so let's look at another scripture in Matthew chapter 20, please. All right, Matthew chapter 20, we're going to look at verse 17 through verse 19. Okay, verse 17 in Matthew 20 says, And Jesus, going up to Jerusalem, took the twelve disciples apart in the way and said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man shall be betrayed unto the chief priests and unto the scribes, and they shall condemn him to death, and shall deliver him unto the Gentiles, to mock and discourage and to crucify him, and the third day he shall rise again. I know that they're fixed on that first half of that verse rather than the, and he shall rise again, because they just think, they just, I know they just didn't see it, but I know that's the greatest part. I love to read that part at the end that says, he, he shall rise again. So Jesus has done it all for you, and he's done it all for me. He's done such wonderful things for us. Don't you love him? Isn't he wonderful? Wonderful, wonderful, okay? Because Jesus died and rose again, you can go home and love your family instead of going to the casino or to the bar, okay? You can also... Love your husband rather than, and honor your husband rather than belittle him. You can help mom with the dishes, okay? All right? You can help mom with the dishes, all right? You can help dad mow the lawn or shovel the snow for dad, okay? You can also, um, we can stop talking about the boss just because everybody wants to, okay? We can stop doing that. And we can also stop doing these things that hurt our witness. And we can stop making people say, I thought you were a Christian. You ever heard that? I heard that before. As soon as I heard that, I was like, I'm going home right now. <laughs> so, but we, you know, when we read the Bible and we keep our hearts tender to God, he'll show us what to do so that doesn't happen. And then he'll have people coming to us and asking us questions. 
going to be wonderful. So let's stay focused on him. All right. So he's done it all. Like I said, that's I think the most the biggest thing I want to get out of I want to get, give you guys is that he's done it all for you. And I think you guys have known that already, but I want to remind you that. We get carried away with a lot of things and many good things, but he's done it all for us. And what, what else does he have to do? Hasn't he done it all? What, does he have to, what else does he have to do for you to serve him? What else does he have to do for you to read the word more often? For you to pray and for you to take a risk to witness to those close to you. It's easy to witness to random people, but how about your family and how about your coworkers? It's tough to do. It's tough to do. I'm in an office of uh, about 19 other people. Um, some of them are from Japan. Um, some of them are not. I think the rest of them are Americans. Some are from China. But I've got people right around me, and it's uh, it's risky though. But um, but there's but if you're willing, though, the Lord will make a way for you. All right. So pray and ask Him for specifically. How am I going to witness to Billy Bob, or how am I going to witness to this next guy? Lord, can I witness to this guy sometime? And you know, have you ever had that happen where people just walk up to you and ask you crazy questions? They just walk up and ask you things. You can do that to them. You can do that right back to them. And and uh, my coworkers all have, I think, just about all of them. Um, so what happens is we we have we go to lunch, and some people go to the cafeteria, some people go out, and all that. And some people eat at their desk, and I do that. I get it out, put it right there on my laptop, and I read while I eat. And they've seen me do that. It's been at least a year that I've started to do that. They all have seen me do that. Now, some of them might not know what I'm doing, but, um, but some do. And some of my Japanese coworkers have asked me, like, what are you reading? And I tell them. And, um, and I love it. It's fun. But, uh, but I could just turn right around and say, oh, I was reading this thing, and this reminded me of you. And probably freak them out. But we can, we can do that. We can do that. I, especially if you're not on work time, have at it. If you're, and sometimes maybe if you're out of the office on lunch, that's, that's your time. You can, you, can take, you can take advantage of that. All right, so think about that. Pray about trying to get, get an opportunity like that. Ask God for an opportunity. All right, and so he's done it all for us. And how close are you letting Jesus get to you? Are you letting him in? Are you letting him take care of the things in your life that, that maybe do or don't please him? Are you, are you willing to ask him that question? Um, go ahead through the house, whatever you want to do. We should be doing that, okay? We should be letting him very, get very close. Often, I've had this thought. God wants to go farther with my life than I want him to. He, if I will just submit to what he wants to do, I, I think we'll see, see him do some things. Things that I wouldn't... I, I heard a preacher say that when he first got to the field, his dream of what he wanted to see God do was about this big. And God let him do this much. And he said, well... You know, my plans right now, my plans, you have to knock out the walls on both sides. So you, you, start, you start having bigger plans. You know, if God's in your plans, make them big. I think it was William Carey. Um, that if, if God's in your plans, make them big. Make them big just to, to, to bless him and to, to, make, to raise his name up. All right, and so what are we going to do tonight and tomorrow and the rest of this week? I think it's summed up in uh, John chapter 15 and verse 4. Let's look at that. John 15 and verse 4. And the uh, ministry of Jesus is drawing to a close in this book of the Gospel of John. At this point, he's telling his disciples a whole lot of things. And one thing he tells them right here is John 15, verse 4. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye, except ye abide in me. We don't spend time with him. We're not going to see him work as much, so we want to we want to see that. I think I, uh, I I know a lot of a lot of other missionaries, and I like to I like to watch them go, and I like to cheer for them. But um, I try not to covet what they're doing. But I think I, I, I also want to do things just as just as great when we go to the field. So so if we do that, no matter where God's got you serving, and He's going to use you. He's going to use you use you use you up. You ever used a pen and all the ink's gone? I hope the ink's going to be gone in our life someday. He's going to use it all. He's like, I got what I needed out of this pen. That's a, I, think, I think the Lord wants to do that with our lives. So let's look to the Lord Jesus every day. And in everything we do, the Lamb of God, for he, is all, he alone is able to save you. Let's look to the Lamb of God, okay? All right. Thank you. Let's pray. Almighty God, thank you for the great uh, truth of Jesus Christ and for, uh, for what he's done for us on the cross, Lord. I pray that you would help us uh, to, be, to be thankful for that every day. 
not to forget it, Lord. I pray that you'll give us opportunity to tell others about that truth. And I pray that you'll help uh, their hearts to receive it. Prepare them now. In Jesus' name, amen.